Methionine restriction extends lifespan. So first, looking at data in male mice, controls were fed a diet that contained 0.43% methionine, and methionine-restricted mice were fed a diet that contained 65% less dietary methionine, or 0.15%. So methionine restriction was started at 12 months of age in this study. And when looking at median survival, so this is the time when half of the population has died, half is still alive, and that uh, median lifespan for the controls was 948 days, we can see an increase in median survival for the methionine restricted mice of about 7%. Now, it wasn't just median survival that was improved, it was also maximal survival, which was defined as the age at when 10% of the collie rem remained. And we can see that for, con for the controls, it was only about two mice left, at about 11, uh, 1,175 days. But in contrast, many more mice were still alive on the methionine restricted diet, somewhere in the seven to eight uh, mice range. So significantly increased maximal survival and median survival for male mice on a methionine restricted diet. Now, one study is nice. Uh, other studies can confirm or deny this, uh, this is a true effect or not. So here we're looking at data in rats. And in this study, uh, rats were fed a diet that contained 0.86% methionine or that, uh, a diet that was methionine restricted, 80% reduced, in this case, 0.17% methionine. And, and this, in this study, in contrast with the data for the uh, mouse study, this was started even younger, so when the rats were uh, only 42 days old. So when looking at median survival, the controls lived 818 days, so 50% survival, but then we can see a significantly increased median survival for the methionine restricted rats, in this case, a 29% increase. And also, maximal survival was increased, uh, by 12% in the methionine-restricted mouse, uh, or sorry, rat group. So from this, we can see that methionine restriction extends lifespan. Now, note that methionine is an amino acid, and amino acids are found in protein. So if we reduce dietary protein intake, we should expect to reduce overall methionine intake. So with that in mind, the focus of this video is going to be how much dietary protein uh, is optimal for health and potentially longevity. And to address that, let's have a look at my own data using an N equals 1 uh, analysis. So to address the question, how much dietary protein is optimal for health and potentially longevity, uh, to, I know my, my dietary protein intake from April uh, 2015 through April of 2022, so for the past seven years. And that's because over that seven-year span, uh, seven span, I've weighed literally all of my food using a food scale as shown there. That's actually the exact uh, brand that I use. All right, and then food amounts are entered into Chronometer, uh, which is an online nutri nutrition tracking app. Now, I'm not currently sponsored by them, so there are many other apps that can do this, and I'm not here to say that Chronometer is the best. So if there are other apps that you use, um, that they may be just as good as Chronometer. All right, so then Chronometer provi provides daily protein intake, and then I log that into an Excel spreadsheet. So let's have a look at my daily protein intake over the past seven years. And that's what we can see here from, again, April 2015 through April of 2022. Now note that each purple dot is the average daily protein intake that corresponds to a blood test. So in between blood test number one and no, uh, number two in 2022, there was a 49 day period. So the purple dot would be the 49 day average for protein intake and that corresponds to test number two. Similarly, using that approach, there was a 42 day period in between test number six in 2021 and test number one in 2022. So the purple dot for that would be a 42 day average for protein intake. So over this seven year span, I've had protein intakes and average daily protein intake as low as 78 grams per day as shown there, but also as high as 148 grams per day. Now, my average over that seven year span is about 114 grams per day. Now note that since 2019, early 2019, so about the last three years, we can see that I've been reducing my protein intake uh, over all these blood tests, so a three year period. Small reductions, but uh, you know, consistent over the th last, last three years. Uh, such that for my last test, again, for test number two in 2022, I averaged 103 grams per day, which is below my average overall average over that span. So the question is why? Why have, have I been reducing overall pro protein intake? So I have up to 36 blood tests for blood biomarkers over this same seven-year span. And that can, that can help us address the question, how much dietary protein is optimal for health and potentially longevity, by looking at the correlation for protein intake with big picture biomarkers over this seven-year period. So in, ter in terms of the qu addressing the question, what's the correlation for dietary protein intake with big picture biomarkers? I covered the big pic picture biomarkers in my last video, so I'll leave a link in the right corner for more details about that approach. So here are the big picture biomarkers and their correlation with dietary protein intake. So what's statistically significant? So uh, actually, let's, first we should uh, uh, delineate some caveats. So if protein intake is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right, then I would reduce overall protein intake for the next test relative to my average. 
Now, if protein intake is significantly correlated with an equal number of biomarkers going in the right and wrong direction, I would then aim for my average protein intake, 114 grams per day over the past seven years. And then in the third situation, if protein intake is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong, then I would increase overall protein intake above my average intake. All right, so now we can address what is dietary protein intake or is it significantly correlated with the, any of these big picture biomarkers. So starting from the top, we can see that a relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose. And just putting that into context, glucose increases during aging is shown here for both men and women, but only focusing on the data for men as that directly applies to me, we can see that it increases during aging. So that, that protein intake for me is significantly correlated with higher glucose, that correlation is going in the wrong direction and hence I gave it a red arrow. So going down the list, we can see that a relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. Homocysteine increases during aging, as shown here, from the 40-year-olds up to 67-year-olds of this study. And again, looking at data for men, we can see that homocysteine increases during aging. So when considering that uh, protein intake is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine, which would be found in youth, that's why I've given it a green arrow. All right, so moving along, uh, a relatively higher protein intake is also significantly correlated with higher blood urea nitrogen, BUN, as shown there. And if you saw my last video, you know that BUN increases during aging, as shown here. So uh, in youth, BUN is relatively low, and then it increases, as, as you can see, by that red line. So when considering that a higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher BUN, that's going in the wrong direction, red arrow. All right, so next up, we can see that a higher protein, rel relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher LDL. LDL increases during aging, as shown here. So relatively uh, youthful values uh, are, uh, youthful values for LDL are, are low, but LDL increases during aging, as you can see by the red arrows. But note that relatively low LDL can be found in youth and also in, a, in advanced age. So for example, looking at a value of 110, which is the average value for someone that's 32 years old in this study, 110 can also be found as the average value for someone that's 88. So is relatively low LDL indicative of youth or aging? So to address that, let's use a different analysis now. It's biomarkers versus biomarkers. In this case, LDL versus these other big picture biomarkers. So what's the correlation for LDL with the big picture biomarkers? And that's what we can see here. So I'm just gonna run through this really quickly as this is a side story to the overall uh, story of dietary protein intake and the big picture biomarkers. So a relatively higher LDL in my case, this may not be true for others, is significantly correlated with higher glucose, higher creatinine, higher bun, higher neutrophils, a lower percentage of lymphocytes and the red arrows indicate that each of these correlations, uh, significant correlations are going in the wrong direction. Higher red blood cells, and I've given that a green hour for now because red blood cells decline during aging. So a positive correlation would potentially uh, uh, improve the age-related decline or resist the age-related decline for red blood cells. But we'll see, as we'll see in a, in a minute, uh, that may not be a green hour, it may be a red. So to summarize the correlations for LDL with a big picture biomarkers, LDL is significantly correlated with five going in the wrong direction and only one in the right direction, which gives it a net score of minus four. So in my case, lower LDL may be optimal, which kind of agrees with the aging data. So in returning to our big picture analysis for protein intake, uh, we can now give LDL a red arrow as relatively lower in my data, again, may be optimal. And again, only for me, I don't know if, if this would be true for others. So moving along, we can see that a relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher neutrophils. And we know that neutrophils increase during aging as shown there, data for men in green, and we can see that age-related increase. So that higher neutrophils are cor significantly correlated with higher protein is going in the wrong direction, red arrow. So a relatively higher protein intake is also significantly correlated with a lower percentage of lymphocytes. And we know, if you saw my last video again, that lymphocyte percentage declines during aging as shown there. And more specifically, the data for men delineated by the red lines, you can see the age-related decline. So that a pro higher protein intake is sig significantly correlated with lower percentage of lymphocytes, that's going in the wrong direction as lower levels are found in the aged and not in youth, so red arrow. All right, so we can also see that a higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher platelets. And I've given that a green arrow, and that's because platelets decline during aging. So starting in youth, 20 to 30 year olds, we can see that platelet levels, and these are data in men, are around 231. And then during aging up to 100 years old, we can see that platelet levels decline to less than 210. So note that my platelets are almost always in the 200 to 300 range. And without getting into too much uh, data, platelets less than 200 and greater than 300 have been shown to be associated with increased all-cause mortality risk, so a U-shaped curve.
So within the 200 to 300 range, is higher necessarily better? So again, we can address that using this biomarker versus biomarker analysis. In this case, platelets versus the other big picture biomarkers. So what's the correlation for platelets with these other big picture biomarkers? So running through the data, relatively higher platelets are significantly correlated with higher blood urea nitrogen, higher VLDL, a lower percentage of lymphocytes, higher red blood cells, which superficially would be a green arrow for now, an older biological age as measured by aging.ai, which would obviously be going in the wrong direction. We don't want to have older biological ages. So to summarize, relatively higher platelets are significantly correlated with four biomarkers going in the wrong direction and only one in the right, which gives the biomarker versus biomarker analysis for platelets a net score of minus three going in the wrong direction. So platelets towards the low end of my range, in this case closer to 200, may be optimal. So when considering the positive correlation for dietary protein intake with platelets, that would then give it a red arrow, as higher may not necessarily be better in my case. All right, so moving right along, a relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with higher red blood cells as shown there. And we know that red blood cells decline during aging. As you can see, they're relatively high in youth, and then they decline such that um, older adults have values less than 4 compared to young adults who have values closer to 4.8. So, but... This, although I've given it a green arrow, note that relatively higher red blood cells in my data are significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. And that's when using this biomarker versus biomarker analysis. So just running through that data real quick, we can see that relatively higher red blood cells are significantly correlated with higher glucose, higher, the, higher creatinine, so potentially worse kidney function, higher blood urea nitrogen, lower uh, AST, the liver enzyme, and that's good news because in my case, AST has a tendency to, or had a tendency to go higher than even the reference range. So uh, that inverse correlation is potentially good news for lower AST. Uh, higher LDL, which we just saw, uh, lower for me, maybe better. Higher neutrophils, a lower lymphocyte percentage, and higher platelets. So having relatively higher red blood cells in my data may not be good, when, when looking at the net effect on the big picture biomarkers, we can see that relatively higher red blood cells are significantly correlated with seven going in the wrong direction and only two, including MCV, uh, in the right direction. Uh, I should mention that MCV levels increase during aging and relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk so that we have an inverse or a negative correlation there that's going in the right direction. So anyway, the net effect for red blood cells would appear to be higher, maybe worse in my data especially when considering the net score of minus five. So note that even within the reference range, my red blood cells have never been higher than the reference range. Too high may be possible. And to summarize, relatively lower red blood cells, but not too low as they decline during aging, may be optimal. So in returning to the uh, question of uh, what's the correlation for dietary protein intake with the big picture biomarkers, we can now give our correlation for red blood cells a red arrow as we know that in, in a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, uh, red blood cells are significantly correlated with more going in the wrong direction than right. So to summarize, now that we've gone through all the significant correlations for protein intake with the big picture biomarkers, we can see that a relatively higher protein intake is, is cor significantly cor correlated with eight going in the wrong direction and only one in the right for a net score of minus seven. Now, if you remember one of the three ca caveats in the beginning, if protein intake is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right, then I would want to reduce overall protein intake relative to the, to the average. And this is one reason why I've been reducing my protein intake over the past three years. It's mainly because of this an analysis like this with a net score of minus seven for protein intake. So when going back to my protein intake uh, graph as shown there, uh, again, we can see that 103 grams per day for test number two. And for the next test, I've actually reduced it a little bit more to 99 grams, slow, slow and small cuts in order to get to uh, you know, the truth rather than big cuts. Uh, is part of my approach for now. Now, when considering that I've been as low as 78 grams per day, that raises the question, is a daily protein intake somewhere between 78 and 103 grams per day optimal? And I don't know, I don't yet know the answer. There are some issues maybe with muscle mass too, that going too low, I may limit muscle mass gains, and I'm not interested in doing that. So there's a balance between muscle mass gains and optimizing the blood biomarkers. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoy the video. Have a great day.